Amen, amen. If you brought your Bibles, take and turn with me, if you would, this morning to the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 12. Book of Hebrews, chapter 12. I'm going to attempt this one more time. Um, if you were here last week, you, you all know that you listened at such a pace, I never made it to my message. Uh, the message was in chapter 12, verses 12 down through uh, 17, and yet we never made it out of the introduction in verse 1 and 2. So today, we're going to make a commitment. We're going to listen at a better pace. Amen. Because there's no way that could have been my fault. Surely to goodness, no. And so if you will, then we'll all get out of here and go eat some good Mexican food. Amen? How else to celebrate Mother's Day? All right. Well, let me read our text. Hebrews 12, starting, and we're not even going to read verse 1 and 2, just to not get distracted. Starting in verse 12, if you found it, say, Happy Mother's Day. Amen. Therefore, strengthen the hands of which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Verse 16 says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Lord, help us now to have a full understanding of what you'd speak to us today in your word. May we be found as willing to say yes and obey whatever it is that you'd speak into our lives today. In Jesus' name that I pray, amen and amen. We're talking about, or what we tried to talk about last week was was running for renewal. There's times in our life, and this is primarily here, uh, presupposing that, uh, that you would know Christ as Savior and Lord, that you'd be a, a follower of Jesus. There's times that we need to be renewed. Would you all agree with that? There's times, there, an old-fashioned word is a word revival. You don't hear that word a lot anymore, but uh, that we need revival in our life, meaning that that there has been a time in my life that my heart was a little hotter uh, for the things of God than it is right now. Anybody attest to that? Amen. They're just moments that we drift. And by the way, you never drift in a good direction, right? You, we never drift towards the Lord. We drift away. And, and so the, the writer here is giving some help and addressing some issues that not necessarily causing the drift, but some issues that crop up because we have drifted from the Lord. In other words, somebody that begins to drift from God, there are certain uh, characteristics that will almost always be present in their life. Now, I'm not going to say that as an absolute, but they're, they're most often they're present. And so here's some of the things that he, he, he gives to us. So look at there in verse 12. He said, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Now, what on earth could that mean? Well, you have to read the verse before it or you'll miss what he's saying there. Listen to what he said in verse 11. Now, chastening seems to be, uh, or excuse, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Did you catch that? Now, no chastening seems to be joyful in the present, but painful. Would everybody agree with that? Not a trick question. It just, it, it doesn't seem fun to be chastened. You remember any of you ever get whooped by your daddy or your mama? Bless God, some of you should have, amen? So some of you missed, amen, your mom and daddy did the whole count thing, didn't they? That's what they did. Anyway, um, so 
so, but how odd would it be? And, and he, this, he's almost dealing with an absurdity here. How odd would it be if mom or dad came in and they're, they're like, and you guys know how this goes, right? It's this universal thing. Son, this is going to hurt me more than it. Y'all have heard the same thing. Now, it was just in my heart to say, well, then give me the belt. You lay on the bed and let me wear you out. Amen. You say, did I ever say that? I'm still alive, aren't I? <laughs> no, no, I didn't ever say that. Are you kidding me? Oh my goodness, you'd have never met me. But this is the point that he's driving home here. You have to understand that what's happening, though it's painful, though it is not something we enjoy. And by the way, also, not only did I not do that, I did it any time that my dad would give me a whoop, and I never stopped him mid-stride and say, I know this is going to reap great benefits in my life, Dad. Thanks. Thanks for loving me the way you do. Get, dad, I know this hurts. Take a break. Are you, you're starting to sweat, Dad. I never did it, right? Why? L listen to the, to the language. But it's painful. It's painful. Now, this is not in the context of your daddy whipping you. This is in the context of God the Father loving you enough to chasten you, to bring about discipline in your life. And he said afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In other words, he's saying what you're walking through, please understand, don't miss this. There's a process. God doesn't waste our trials. God doesn't waste our chastening that he's doing in our life. But I, I, all that's a setup for verse 12. Therefore, because of this chastening, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. This is in the language of, of a coach. How, a, how a, a coach might talk to a player. A coach might look to a player and, and, and they wouldn't say, strengthen your hands and your feeble knees. But here's what a coach would say. Your body language right now is terrible. Hey, hey, could, could, you, could you quit pouting? Any parents ever said that, by the way? Any, any, I got more whippings for pouting as a kid than anything I did. I think my parents were abusive. <laughs> pouting. What happens when you pout? You, you, you notice you never stand up straight when you pout? You never just like, amen. You don't strut when you pout. What do you do? Is that right? Do your kids pout the same way? Have they been copycatting from my kids? You, you, your head goes down. Man, your arms are hung low. Now come back to the text. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Here's what, here's what the, the, the writer is trying to help us to do. He's trying to say, rather than you whine about your hard life, how about you trust that God knows what he's doing with your life? Rather than you live the life of a victim and, 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 and constantly in this state of, of complaining or tweeting or posting or whatever else you're doing to tell everybody how hard life, we get it, life's hard. We understand that, that it, issues come along. But the writer is saying, how about we trust God with it? How, how about we, we, rather than drop our heads and get weak in the need, he says, strengthen the hands which hang down. Now, I think that this is first, listen to me, I think this is first to the one with the slumped hands and the feeble knees. I think you have a personal responsibility to strengthen them yourself. Amen, preacher. That's right. We do. But the second part, I think that there's also a, a, a compelling argument that can be made in the entirety of Scripture that says we should also help one another. I'm fitting to walk out where you're living here. You... You don't help people 
when you allow them to live the life of a perpetual victim. You don't help people to patronize them when they talk of their hard life and all they hear back from their Christian friends is, oh, I know, girl, it's hard. Have you ever noticed how this works? You can go on, any, probably anybody in here on social media? 99%. Okay, great. You ever notice how this is? You can get sympathy for anything. Anything. You could do the dumbest thing on planet earth. The dumbest. And come and whine about how hard life is because you did something dumb. And 50 people are going to come on there and go, oh, it's just so hard. Mm -hmm. So hard. can't believe you put up with that. You're not helping the situation. Strengthen the hands. Don't come and applaud that they're hanging low. Strengthen the feeble knees. Don't come and, and, and blow wind on that fire that needs to be put out. Now, <laughs> what that also doesn't mean is that you get on there and rebuke them. Okay, so the, the prophet in me, that'll make more sense next week. By God's grace, we're going to start a spiritual gift series. The, the prophet in me wants to respond that way and say, well, your life wouldn't be quite as hard if you didn't do stupid things like that. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Don't say that. Okay. Uh, it's better that you'd use my bride's mercy um, and, and give... <laughs> Don't encourage her, <laughs> brother. That's a bad time, day, man. <laughs> the, the, the point being, though, privately, we, we need to come to those people and help them to understand, hey, you, you quit trusting in the sympathy you're getting, whether that be social media or your job or wherever. Trust in the Lord. Why? Remember what he said. This chastening, though it's painful... The reward is a peaceable fruit of righteousness. You can trust him in the process. He goes from there, and by the way, if you didn't like that, you'll not like this, okay? This doesn't get really any easier. He said, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. These are really interesting um, pictures that he's painting here. So make your path straight for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather to be healed. What could he possibly mean in make your path straight? I don't know. Do you remember Jesus' reference? Straight is the way. Do you remember this? Straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to righteousness. Here's what he's doing. Keep all this in context with verse 11. All right? And now keep verse 11 in context, context with verse 1 and 2. You remember, don't get me started on verse 1 and 2, but you remember, right? He was running a race, right? And, and you don't win the prize if you don't finish the, the, the finish, go, go across the finish line. And so it's in this context. We're running the race. Now we've been chasing. Now we're pouting. But listen to what he says. Make, your, make straight your path so your feet... And that what is lame may not be located, but rather healed. He's recognizing and calling out those that got off track. I believe, now some scholars are kind of all over the board on this, but I, I believe he's still addressing Christians here. Matter of fact, I think in the, the bulk of this entire text, he's still addressing Christians. Make straight paths for your feet. Okay, well, what could that mean? Well, I think we understand that. That's kind of where we started, the whole drifting. What happens is you drift off course. How many of you understand that he, he, it's real easy to be running your race for the Lord? Man, have a heart just burning in you to do the will of God. I'm, I'm pursuing the Lord. I'm spending time in the Word. I'm in prayer. I'm, I'm sharing the gospel. I'm, I'm involved in my local church. I'm serving. I'm giving. I'm doing all of it. But something comes along and diverts me off my path. 
diverts me off my path, gets me to this place to where my life now doesn't even resemble what my life then resembled. How many of you know that this happens every day with people? Every day, people, we wrestle with this stuff. And what happens is, if you run that way long enough, here's what he's addressing. If you don't do this quickly, straightening out the path, he's saying what is lame, meaning that you're not able to run the race. You're, you're, you're crippled. You're, the longer and further away you go, the more crippled you become. And here's what the word he used. You will be eventually be dislocated rather than healed. The only place of healing to make yourself your soul whole is back on the track of the will of God. Do you see what he said? He's using all these word pictures And all of them are saying, the only safe place for you is to pursue the will of God. The further off track you go, the more dumb things you do. And eventually he's using the word, you're dislocated. Now, again, scholars are kind of everywhere with this. I don't believe here, nor do I believe on further down, is he talking about apostasy. I don't think that's what he's talking about at all. But what will happen is this. There's a bird up there. That'll bless you, won't it? Amen. Can I have a motion to adjourn? (laughs) I don't know what I was saying. I do. Okay. I remember it now. I don't think he's talking about apostasy here. Squirrel. It wasn't a squirrel, it was a bird. (laughs) He's talking about the one that has run so far, they no longer resemble, uh, off track, they no longer resemble what they once did. They used to, whenever they talked, they sounded like they they really loved Jesus. Now when they talk, they sound like somebody that's never met Jesus. The warning the writer is giving. You notice how quiet it got? (laughs) The warning the writer is giving said, what's going to happen is you're going to be dislocated. You're going to get so far, you ain't going to find your way back. You're going to get so far out there that that you can't see your way back. He even gives a description further on down here, and we're going to get to it, of, of some more results of that. So here's what he's saying. It's a warning. It's a call. Make straight your paths. Translation, stay with the will of God. It's still best for your life, whether you like it or not. Even if the, the, the pain of, of chastening is hurting and you thought it was unfair, which by the way, I thought all the times that my parents whipped me was unfair. Anybody else? It was really, really rare that I thought, I deserve this. I've been bad. I had this coming. But it was usually like, because I had some friends that their parents didn't whip and they did the whole county thing. I prayed that my dad would learn how to count to three. And I'm like, why can't my parents do what they're doing? He's saying, there's going to be moments that this isn't fun. There's going to be moments that this is painful. But if you'll put your trust and keep your trust in the Lord, make your path straight, commit to the will of God, even when it's hard, even when it's, it, it doesn't make sense, which, by the way, means you've got to get rid of that goofy theology that says, oh, I just, and people still say this to me, oh, I just knew it was the will of the Lord. How? Just whenever it all worked out easy. It's really hard to preach when that's going on. I've yet to find that the will of the Lord be easy. It's difficult. There's challenges. There's there's obstacles. I don't care what some other guys now names has said to you. Life itself is hard. It's a challenge. He goes from there and and he, he, in verse 14, gives us, again, some very practical help. He said, pursue peace with all people. 
wonder why he put that in there. It almost seems disjointed to, to insert that. I believe because one of the reasons that we often get disjointed, get dislocated, why? Is relationships. Now, I think there's something else that's happening here as well, but I'll, I'll get to that. But I think often it's relationships. I've, again, been a pastor a very long time, and rarely do people leave the church or walk away even from the Lord because, uh, well, I've just been bad. No, it's because a relationship went bad. Somebody did me wrong. Somebody hurt my, what? Feelings. It's really rare that somebody hurt my theology that I'm leaving church. You ever notice that? It's really rare that somebody is like, well, they believe different than me. I just can't worship with them. That's not usually the case. It's usually, is this microphone doing something weird? Sounds like I'm in a barrel. Anyway, th- there's, there's somebody set in my seat. You guys know how dangerous that is in church. Somebody got my parking spot. Somebody did something that offended me to the point that I can't get over it. So therefore, I'll show you. I'll walk away. But now listen, he said pursue peace with, what's the next word in your Bible? All. You ever read your Bible and go, now why'd he have to say that? Because have you noticed pursuing peace with most is not that hard? It's always that rare minority that just seems to never have gotten a brain. It's always that rare minority that just seems to somehow get under my skin. That that rare minority that just seems to be, I wonder if they're the Antichrist. Have you ever noticed how it's those people that annoy you that is always against God, not for him, right? Right, they're the the evil ones um, in what they're, they're doing. Hey, fellas, let's do something else. Bring me a, hey, Morgan. Bring me a mic or something if you would so I don't lose my mind up here. But what he's doing here is he's helping us to see, though the problem could be with some others, the solution will always reside with you. Anybody listening? Though the problem may be with some others, it may be that somebody actually did do you wrong. The result or the solution will reside with you. He said, pursue peace with all people, everyone, even the one that you do think might be an undercover spy for the enemy. Might be a coworker, might be a a boss, it might be, uh, it could be a family member. Well, those are painful, amen? Pursue peace with all people. He also follows it and says, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Why is that there? Holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, he's not given a picture of work hard and you will gain. Thank you. So would y'all clap for him? Amen. What he's not doing is he's not saying work hard and somehow you'll earn eternity. That's not what's happening at all. When he's saying this, uh, he's saying without it, which no one will see, please understand the writer has not abandoned the gospel. Our holiness still comes from Jesus. Our how many of you? No. How many of you know that when the demons fell, they all fell into sound systems? <laughs> Amen. That's just how it goes. Hey, thank all of our tech guys. They work hard for us every week. <laughs> The only time people ever look back there is with a frown when something goes wrong. If it's all working right, you're like, well, hey, man, they're supposed to be doing their job. Whenever it goes wrong. Anyway, thank you. I appreciate you all. Um, Pursue it with all people because um, he's calling us to be a peaceable people, pursue holiness. Why? Because we are wholly dependent upon Jesus for our salvation. But now here's where I wanted to get to. Look in verse 15. He said, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. This is where it gets controversial. Looking carefully, 
lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. I don't believe here again, I don't think he's talking to unbelievers. The word here, when it says fall short, means to fall back. In other words, he's still describing the one who once walked with the Lord, but now has come to this place. They've gotten so far away from God, they've gotten bitter. Well, how do you know it? He follows it with that. He said, lest any root of bitterness spring up, causing trouble, and by this become defiled. There are people that once had a hot heart for the things of God, once had a good and strong relationship with the Lord, but yet they begin to drift from God. They get off their course, and if left long enough, which by the way, Christians will often do this. We'll just kind of watch people just float out the door, just kind of just drift away. And then what happens is, he's saying it, if they don't correct their path, they're eventually going to be just bitter. They'd be the most miserable pe people on earth. They just, well, I thought that guy used to go to church. I thought that guy used to really, you know, really love the Lord. Well, th they may have. Man, they're bitter now. Yeah, he, he gave a warning about it. And he, he, I love the language he uses. He said, lest a root of bitterness spring up. Here, the, the language is so important. Number one, it's a root. You didn't see it starting, right? Because it's, it's under the surface. You, you don't see that stuff coming. But he uses the word springing up. He doesn't say just oozing up. No, he said it springs up. In other words, he's trying to describe, this will seem as though it came out of nowhere. It didn't. It came from that moment where you begin to compromise and allow yourself to just drift from the things of God. Those small compromises you thought wouldn't cost you. The writer of Hebrews is saying, no, it'll cost you big in the end. You're going to come to this place to where You'll be bitter. He even uses the word, and many will become defiled by that. Many will become defiled. Now, here's where we'll, where we'll, we'll wrap up and close. He, he illustrates this with an interesting guy that we don't talk a lot about. He doesn't get a lot of press uh, clipping. A guy by the name of Esau. Do y'all remember Esau from back in the Old Testament? Um, it says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Now, let me help you with two words there, fornicator and profane. I don't think that he's necessarily just intending for this to be, because often when you use the word fornicator, it's talking about sexual sin and that kind of thing. That's not really the intent of the writer here, and the word profane, if we were to describe somebody as profane today, we would most often be talking about they are vulgar. Oh, they're so profane. Man, the language that they use and how they, you, you, you all know what I'm talking about? That's how we would use the word profane. Both of those would be wrong if you take that into our culture and how we use the, the, the language. The word fornicator here would, would, would really mean to be one of multiple partners. Here, it would be talking of Esau, that he is one that has cheated on God. He's talking about his soul. When he uses the word profane, it, he's, he's talking about, there's two, and I don't remember what the words were, but I, I, I did some word studies this week on this. There's two Latin words that make this up. And what it means is, the first one is the word against. The second one is the word temple or God. So it literally means when he's profane, he is against the temple or he is against God. Now use them both. He's a fornicator, meaning he's cheating on God, but he is also a profane guy against the temple, meaning against God or the things of God. What once might have brought pleasure to him now just irritates him. Hey, by the way, this preacher will give witness to that. You get me out of sorts with, with people, which will ultimately get me out of sorts with God, and I don't deal with that. I don't keep short accounts with that. The things that used to bring enjoyment in my life now annoy me. I'm not ready to worship if I'm ticked. I'm the only one, I guess. Anybody else? Any of, see, some of you looking at me like, well, I've never gone to church mad. No, you stayed home and pouted. <laughs> Amen, right? But I'm a pastor. I have to come mad or not. <laughs> Bets and I 
Some of you know this, I've told you this. Our first year in ministry at Split Log, where we were at, our first church, we drove about 45 minutes one way, and we had some really passionate moments in the car going over there. And I've heard this leaked out that some of y'all have had passionate moments on the way to church before. Have you ever noticed how the enemy works in that way? It's like everything's been good. You've been looking forward to church until you get in a car with that woman. <laughs> that guy, sorry. We get in a car and head that way. I'm trying to handle the word of God. And it's as though the devil just took her over. Now, listen, her story's different. Her story's different. She's like, my pastor is the devil. <laughs> and we would fight and scratch. And I mean, we, I mean, not like we didn't scratch, okay? She probably wanted to scratch me. But oh, we'd bless one another, that whole ride over there. And I'm like, take her, Lord. <laughs> we'd pull into that church house. Now listen. Listen how this goes. We'd pull in that church house. Some deacon be out there to open our door. And, 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 and I kid you not, we jump out of that car. Man, isn't it good to be at the, at the Lord's house today? Been wanting to kill my wife for the last 45 minutes. But oh, it's good to worship. You, you, you put on your fake Christian face, right? Now quit judging. Because I can see some of you like, you shouldn't have done that. Neither should you. My point being, I wasn't in a place I was ready to worship. What happened is it, it wounded my spirit. What happened is I was drifting. Why? Not because how I'm treating God, but how I'm treating her. Which, by the way, how I treat her translates into how I treat him. You can't separate how we treat people and how we treat God. You can't be a jerk or a jerkette, girls, to your neighbor, husband, spouse, wife, kids, parents. And then just worship like it's not a thing. He said, you be careful. This root of bitterness, it'll spring up. Why? Because you'll have your eye so much on this person or this issue that has ticked you off with your righteous indignation. You ever notice how we love that one, right? Right? It's righteous. And, and he said, this root of bitterness will spring up. Now, here's all I'll say about this. I'm, I'm out of time. I've got to close. He's saying, this thing will defile your life. I've watched people be so overcome with this. They, they just become a different person. You say, what's that got to do with Esau? Everything. You know what Esau did? He compromised in that. Just like you would compromise about being and how you're treating somebody. You're compromising. Esau comes in. He's hungry. Let me back up. Esau comes in. Esau's hangry. You know what happened? His wife put him on the ketos. That's what happened. Took all these carbonites away from him. He sowed his birthright. Now, this is bigger than I've got time to explain. But there's an interesting statement being made here. He said, for you know that afterwards, after he'd sold it for a morsel of food, he wanted to inherit the blessing. And he was rejected for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Now here's where some kind of lose their mind. Um, oh gosh, does that mean that poor Esau wanted to be saved and Jesus said no? That's not, that's no, uh-uh. Esau just wanted the inheritance. Esau wanted to throw his temper tantrum and eat, rejecting the plan of God for his life. And then Esau was only repenting because he got caught. It was costing him something. Because it was, it was, there was real cost. He finally came to his senses and like, oh, I want it back. Not that he wanted God's plan for his life. Not that he wanted to pursue the will of God. But that he just, he didn't like what he lost. 
It's the equivalent of being sorry for your sin in the sense that you got caught, but not sorry that you were a sinner. It's sorry that I'm going to jail, just not sorry that I happened to murder someone. So when he says that there's no place of repentance, he's given us this picture that real repentance means I acknowledge what I am before God and the only help and hope that I have is my trust in him. So here's my question and we'll, we'll pray. Are you drifting? Maybe a question you could ask is, has there been a time in your life that your heart, your life has been hotter for the things of God than they are now? Been a time in your life that you were, had more excitement? Been a time in your life that, that you were walking closer with the Lord than you are now? Here's a, here's a good part. You don't wait until you're bitter to make your path straight, to strengthen the hands that hang low, the feeble knees. He's saying the moment that you recognize the chastening of God, and I thank God he's a chastening God. Thank God he's a father that cares enough to chasten us. The Bible says he chastens those whom he loves. The moment you recognize it, the call is, hey, how about you stand up straight? How about you lift your head, lift your hands, stop pouting, make your path straight, come back to the Lord. Why? You go far enough, you just get to a place where all you'll want is just pain to stop. You won't want the Lord. It's a, it's a warning. A warning of danger. And he's saying the ball's in your court. What are you going to do with it?